Welcome, and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. I'm your host, Giannis Papadakis, Business Development Manager at Crexy, and today we are thrilled to sit down with Sean Lyons and Ryan Tobias, founding partners at Triad Real Estate Partners. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guests. Ryan Tobias launched his career at Arcus and Millichap, focused on selling multifamily and student housing properties throughout Illinois, including Chicago and the greater Midwest. He went on to work at Benzwinger, a global real estate company, where he grew the firm's multifamily business while working extensively on office and industrial transactions as well. Ryan has closed over $750 million in real estate transactions across 19 states. Founding Triad Real Estate Partners marks his return to focusing on private client relationships in multifamily and student housing in the smaller markets of Illinois and the Midwest. Ryan has a BA from the University of Michigan and is a licensed real estate broker in the states of Illinois and Michigan. John Lyons has close to 15 years of experience selling investment real estate in Chicago and throughout the country. Before starting Triad, Sean was a senior associate at, Mar at Marcus and Millichap. As a director of its national housing group, he concentrated his efforts on selling apartment properties through the north side of Chicago and throughout the Midwest. Sean has brokered the sale of more than $750 million in investment property in over 160 transactions. These sales include over 4,000 apartment and student housing units. Sean has serviced his clients by diversifying the real estate investment portfolios and helping facilitate their 1031 exchanges into other product types, including single tenant and multi-tenant retail, office and industrial investments. Sean has a BA from Boston College and is a licensed real estate broker in the states of Illinois and Wisconsin. He enjoys being a dad, riding, traveling, and playing golf. And with that, let's dive in. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to be on the podcast. We know you're busy and I uh, really appreciate you coming in to talk to us. Happy to be Happy here, to be guys. Here. Thanks for having us. Sean, I'm curious, what do you, uh, what do you enjoy writing? Um, I enjoy writing um, a little bit about my uh, travels. We, we do a, a fair amount of travel for work. And, uh, I, and one of the things I find really interesting about the United States is how diverse it is by region. Uh, so I'm always kind of observing that as, a, as I travel around. And uh, so I kind of like to write and, and reflect on, on uh, that experience. Awesome. That's great. That's uh, interesting. You know, if, imagine uh, somebody that works in real estate appreciating the land in different places. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no. uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not all robots. <laughs> right. So I'm curious, how did you first get involved in commercial real estate, particularly in the field of student housing? And I'll leave it to either of you to, to answer first. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, I started in real estate right out of college. Um, I kind of, I wanted to, I kind of fell in love with sort of architecture and real estate development um, to a certain degree in college and was just looking to get my foot in the door into the industry. Brokerage was kind of that, was that, you know, channel and and Sean and our other partner, Sean, were working at Marcus and Millichap at the time. They hired me right out of college in 2005. Um, it, it, we were doing multifamily at the time, mostly city Chicago, um, Chicago MSA is kind of smaller private client brokerage, which is really the kind of the bread and butter of Marcus and Millichap. And, um, we, uh, you know, we, we kind of opportunistically, uh, happened on a couple of student housing deals. We did uh, a deal at Notre Dame. We did one down at Illinois state university. And at the time, this is the mid two thousands, it was a pretty nascent industry and there just wasn't a ton of competition. We felt like multifamily was much more saturated and that there'd be an opportunity for us to kind of be experts in that field. And we jumped in with both feet and did a lot of that um, in the late 2000s and, and through the great financial crisis and then in, in, in with Triad. Um, it's proven to be a, a great strategy that that space has matured a lot. There is a lot more competition now. It's become more sophisticated. There's more capital providers. But um, at the time, it was uh, it was pretty wide open. Yeah, and I, I would add to that too, it, it, you know, there's obviously the major food groups of, of real estate that everybody knows, you know, office, industrial, um, hospitality, retail. Uh, what we really liked, you know, coming from a multifamily, which is just a massive, massive, um, you know, space. Um, we, we liked sort of the niche component of student housing. 
Um, and there's a couple uh, different product types that meet that criteria. You know, there's um, self-storage, there's medical office, you know, these sort of subcategories, if you will, of, um, of real estate investment. And we found that, you know, given we were a smaller boutique firm, um, that we were able to, you know, compete and, uh, and win business in, in those in a more niche market. Um, as opposed to, you know, competing against the world in, in the larger uh, food groups. And so that's what initially attracted us to, to student, um, you know, back when we got into it, you know, over a decade ago. Nice. And what led you to found your own firm? You know, what were some of the challenges you faced along the way? And how did you overcome those challenges? So I'll start here, Ryan. I, yeah, I, I mean, we, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I would, I, I would just, I always like to say this, um, particularly now, now, as I think we're entering a different, um, you know, market coming up here is, you know, our, our firm was, was basically born out of failure. Um, so, you know, when, in uh, 08, 09, when the last financial crisis hit, uh, we really, um, you know, most people in bridge just stopped making money overnight. You know, transactions just came to a screeching halt. There was no capital available. Um, and so we kind of looked around and, and myself and Sean and Ryan and were like, hey, look, if, you know, if we're not going to make any money um, during this time, you know, there's no reason, for, um, you know, be, given where we were at the time working for a larger firm. And so we kind of said, you know, if there's going to be a recovery process, then that, that's a good time to start building uh, our own product, our own brand, and and start our own firm. And so we really kind of, you know, it rose out of the ashes of the uh, 08, 09 um, credit crisis. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. It was sort of kind of backs against the wall. There wasn't really, um, another, it felt like, you know, some in some ways it's the worst time and in other ways it's the best time. And as Sean mentioned, it'd be interesting to see here over the next few years, um, you know, if we enter a no, new phase of kind of a bear market and a recession that we haven't seen in quite some time, and there are a lot of people in this business that haven't seen one um, if you've only been around the last 10 years or so. So, you know, but that it's not a bad time, actually, in my opinion, I, 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 if I wouldn't have changed a, a thing, I don't think it would have been, um, there would have been a better time actually to kind of take your lumps and get started. We would have been doing that anyway, um, working at a big shop. So uh, it ended up working out pretty well. Nice. Now, what lessons did you learn early on or, you know, what mentors worked with you to help you find success as you, you kind of, you know, first this, you know, new endeavor together? Well, you know, Sean and John are, you know, they had started in the, in the business a couple of years before me and are, are a few years older than I am. So, I mean, they, for me, you know, those guys were, were the mentors. Um, and they had not, some. Not, not that many years older, right? Let's be clear. Uh, yeah. A few years old, <laughs> couple, couple few, and, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, so that was a bit, that was a big thing. Um, they had some of their own mentors themselves, but for us, um, you know, a, a lot of it was, it, you know, we're, we're a partnership. There's three of us and, um, and we've leaned on each other a lot in different ways at different phases of the business um, based on what's going on with our family, different experience levels, different ages and whatnot. And I think that's been our biggest, our biggest strength, um, in persevering to this point. Um, you know, there's a lot of other important people on the way, but no one more important than the, than the three of us together so far. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that. I would, I would also say, you know, from my, my personal standpoint, you know, a lot of my, um, mentors, if you will, were not, um, real estate related at all. They were, uh, they were entrepreneurs really. And, you know, by mentors, I mean, I didn't necessarily know them, <laughs> but, um, I read about them and, uh, you know, listened to audiobooks and did all kinds of, you know, research on, um, successful entrepreneurs. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I, I think we're kind of, you know, when somebody asks me what I do, I say, you know, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur that happens to be in real estate. And I, and I think that's very true. Um, you know, when you start your own business, regardless of what it is, um, you know, you're an entrepreneur. And so I looked, 
to other people who had done that successfully. Um, a couple in real estate, Sam Zell being a big one, um, but a number of people outside of real estate that, um, you know, who, who I wanted to kind of model, um, you know, our success after. Um, and I found that really, really helpful. Um, you know, and, and you asked about, you know, challenges, um, you know, the, the there's an inordinate a number of challenges, you know, particularly in this business as you're as you're getting going, because you know nobody knows necessarily who you are, and and you have to kind of build a brand, um, you know, to compete with some of the largest you know companies in the world, um, which is not easy to do. Um, and I, I think the you know the, the word that I always go back to with that is um, is resilience, you know. I think the one thing that that Ryan and Sean and I have in common is we just we just don't give up. <laughs> you know, we just I mean it's it's a, it's a roller coaster ride and it, it, you know it ebbs and flows. Um, but we just always said you know when when we made the commitment to do this together that you know sort of failure wasn't an option. And I think it's really the resilience that has has pulled us through to where we are today. Awesome. You know, pivoting a bit, let's explore our topic for today, student housing. Can you give us a brief overview of the fundamentals of the sector? Uh, and, you know, explain to me like I've never, you know, dug into a student housing deal. I mean, what, do I need, what do I need to know? Sure. That's a, it's a broad topic, but, um, you know, in general, you know, and this comes up a fair amount when I kind of tell people what we do, but I mean, student housing is, is, you know, the, the big 10,000 foot view, right. Is you know, generally speaking, privately owned apartments near universities that house predominantly students. It tends to be rented by the bedroom versus by the unit, although it doesn't have to be a lot of the smaller mom and pops and whatnot still operate by the unit it tends to be furnished, uh, although not always. Um, and it's, you know, a mix of at larger, more strong markets, it's usually annual leases, but in smaller markets, it can be just school year leases. Um, other than that, it looks and feels mainly like an apartment property that you might see anywhere else. Um, it does have a little bit heavier bed count. Oftentimes it, you got, you know, a traditional multifamily, you got maybe ones, twos, and threes, maybe some studios, um, you know, in student housing, you're going to see a lot of four bedroom units often with bed bath parity, which means the same amount of beds to baths, en suite, four bed, four bath, three bed, three bath, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's become a, it's become a pretty big national industry, it, you know, when, and it wasn't that long ago, 20 years ago or so, it was pretty much all mom and pop, small private capital, um, a lot of houses and small apartment buildings, you know, near campus, a lot of you folks probably, you know, lived in one. I lived in a, lived in a house owned by one guy, you know, at University of Michigan, um, I think when I was there in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, the first true student housing, you know, in 50 years was built, and and there's been a lot subsequent, and that's the case across the country. Um, but again, but the fundamentals are typically more like apartments, a um, little more operationally intensive. You lease up all year long, you do a pre-leasing cycle, a little heavier on marketing and um, payroll, typically. Um, but it's, uh, and it's proven itself to be a very resilient asset class. Um, you know, it, there was a minor blip in the beginning of COVID, but even so most campuses fared pretty well. Um, it fared very well in the last recession. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, holding very strong right now. Yeah, I think that the, the main difference that if somebody was new getting into student housing, say from coming from multifamily or another product type, uh, what's unique about it as an asset class is there is um, there's a, a leasing cycle um, that is specific to every university um, where, you know, the kids go out and start to look for where they're going to live in, in the next year. Um, and, you know, if you don't lease up or get to a, um, you know, a number where, uh, you know, say north of 85 percent occupied, um, during that window of time, um, then, you know, you're going to be in trouble for the following year. Um, so it's very cyclical um, for, on a year-to-year -year basis. And, you know, there, it's kind of this, um, you know, race to the finish to get your, your property leased up 
um, before, you know, people stop looking. And again, that, that you know, every market kind of has its own pattern and rhythm to, to that um, lease up cycle. But that's really the, in my opinion, the critical differentiator of student housing is, you know, at some point, you know, there's a of kids that are going to rent um, beds in a given year. And, uh, you know, if you know, it's not like, you know, a bunch of new people are going to show up, you know, out of nowhere. Um, so you, you really, um, uh, the sort of marketing uh, and operational, as, as Ryan mentioned, component to, you know, staying full and sort of never being um, comfortable with the fact that, you know, you're only as good as your last leasing cycle is, is a really critical component to, to the student housing business. So you, you said something that I'm interested to dig in on, which is that it's a little more um, management intensive than traditional multifamily assets. Would you say that in areas around universities, is the return that you're getting from student housing outweighing the multifamily properties that might be just outside of that university zone? Is the juice worth the sweets is, you know, to boil it down. And most, yeah. And most communities, the answer is kind of a resounding yes to that. Um, uh, it, but you know, there are some exceptions to that, you know, urban campuses tend to be a little trickier, right? I mean, you know, we're based in Chicago, you got a number of universities right there in the city, but you also have traditional apartments, what we call kind of the shadow market, which is all over the place. So in those markets, things kind of blend together, but you know, let's take your sort of typical down the middle college town, you know, in the, in the U S you know, a, a Champaign, Illinois, a Stillwater, Oklahoma and Athens, Georgia, uh, you know, the list goes on the, the demographics of the student body, especially at those upper tier universities, um, you know, your, your, your top 50 schools or so, I mean, you're going to see significantly higher rent potential, you know, from the student body than say the surrounding town. Um, and, and there's also the buy the bed premium that you're not going to get, you know, I mean, you have a three bedroom where you're maybe charging as much as eight, 900,000 per bed near campus, that same three bedroom might be 1500 a unit, you know, off well off campus to the multifamily market. It differs from market to market, but in almost your, all your typical, almost all, maybe all your typical kind of college town settings, it's a pretty significant premium to be you know, near campus and be what we call purpose-built student housing. Yeah, that, that purpose-built trend um, is really not that old, um, you know, compared to a lot of the other asset classes. So when you look at, you know, this, you know, the, the class A um, sort of, uh, you know, walk to campus, high-end student housing that has become sort of the new normal, you know, that didn't really exist, you know, 15 years ago. I mean, when we first got into student, these were just starting to come online. And, and they're basically, you know, I mean, I describe it as like a, like a boutique hotel. You know, I mean, they're fully amenitized. You know, they have, uh, you know, 24-7 gyms and tanning salons and lazy rivers and, I mean, you name it. You know, the, these, uh, you know, which is always interesting to me as the father of kids because it's like, you know, are we setting these kids up for failure? You know, they're, they're living in a, you know, in this beautiful, uh, you know, fully amenitized, um, uh, you know, student housing property. And then they graduate, they get their first job and, you know, they're living in a, you know, some, some sort of crappy studio like, like most of us did. Um, but that's a separate topic. The, the point is because these, um, these newer purpose-built student housing properties are so um, high-end in terms of what they offer, the spread between what you can get, you know, on a per-bed basis, um, you know, compared to what Ryan called the shadow market, like the, you know, the, the B-class, you know, older multifamily is, is significant. 
And, you know, it does justify that, you know, the juice is definitely worth the squeeze in that case. The challenge is, you know, how many kids at a given school um, are able to afford that level of, of luxury, if you will. And, um, and that really varies in, like dramatically market to market and state to state. Got it. Now, uh, Ryan, you'd mentioned, you know, you saw a blip in the market during COVID-19. Let's dig into that a little bit. You know, with many colleges you know, shutting down, pivoting to online classes and students taking gap years, what happened to the sector during COVID-19? Well, it is a pretty disparate, um, you know, across the country. I mean, it just really depended on what, what university, what state, um, and kind of what the protocols in place were, you know, uh, California, for example, had a, a very kind of stringent approach to COVID, um, you know, longer, more online classes and whatnot, the universities and there and student housing suffered, uh, pretty greatly. That being said, there, you, you know, it wasn't as bad as you think, because there were still, a, you know, first of all, there were a lot of kids, even that second year, you know, uh, 2020 to 2021 school year that had already signed leases. And, and so, and, you know, some of those folks just chose to commit some others even signed leases, even when they knew there wasn't going to be class because they just didn't want to live in mom and dad's basement. Like if I'm taking class on my laptop, uh, in my apartment, at least, you know, I don't have anyone to answer to, and I'm around my other friends and, you know, there's still a, you know, bar down the street, maybe instead of you know, back in the suburbs, back home. So even in those places that went fully remote, went fully online and, and definitely suffered, it wasn't as bad as you might think. What would you say the in a lot impact. of places? It really, um, it, you know, in, in Texas. It, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Repeat that. Can you repeat that question? Uh, you, you just came in on a delay, so I didn't hear that you were uh, continuing your point. You, you can go ahead and finish. So yeah, so what I was just saying there, I mean, <clears throat> as I mentioned, California, uh, obviously, one thing uh, opposite of the spectrum you know, Texas and Florida and some certain places that had a different approach to COVID-19, um, really didn't miss a beat. You know, there was, and there were a few examples. Um, Michigan state is, is one, uh, that essentially shut their dorms down. Um, and even those that were open were very, um, de-densified and as such, the private market flourished. Um, you know, there was, there was less on-campus housing, so the off-campus housing market actually had stellar years. So really wide range across the spectrum, but generally speaking, um, the states that had stricter laws, uh, East Coast, West Coast, um, suffered a, a little bit a little bit more. Um, and, and those that didn't, didn't really miss much of a beat. Yeah, I, I think this, this speaks to, Ryan mentioned it earlier uh, in, well, in the beginning, you know, how, how um, Student housing has really proven itself as a as an asset class that you know has staying power at this point. Um, it's been through you know a couple iterations and and sort of comes out strong every time. Uh, and what we saw during COVID, I mean, obviously when it first came down, um, you know everybody was expecting the worst, you know, across the board. Um, but particularly in student housing, because, you know, these kids are, are as they're shutting down schools, you know, we're thinking, well, you know, everybody's just going to try to break their lease and, and, and leave and go home. And sort of the opposite turned out to be true. Um, you know, most parents who, you know, parents are the co-sign on the lease, you know, they're, they're personally guaranteed on it. So I think a lot of parents took the approach that, you know, we made this commitment and, you know, we're, we're sort of um, signed up for it. And, you know, if you're going to be taking online classes, then, you know, you might as well do it, you know, from school and at least try to get some, you know, experience of what it's like being on campus. Because obviously those kids really kind of got robbed of that, um, you know, as a result of, of the shutdown. And so, you know, occupancies during COVID, you know, pretty much nationally, you know, remained in the, you know, mid eighties to, you know, upper eighties. And, you know, we were all expecting, everybody in the space was expecting, you know, 
sort of the absolute worst case scenario where, you know, these things are all empty. Um, and it, it really proved um, to kind of hold up against the challenges of COVID. And I think that's, that's going to really speak um, well to the asset class going forward, because the fact that we were able to kind of get through this on the other side, you know, pretty much fully intact um, speaks volumes. Speaking of you know, moving forward, you know, what are you seeing now? And, you know, what does your crystal ball say about what's coming down the pipe for student housing? Um, I see you recently attended a student housing conference in Austin. Can you share, you know, what was your most impactful takeaways from that? Well, uh, so, uh, Sean can speak to the to the interface conference in Austin. Uh, he was down there this year. I didn't make the trip, but um, you know, well, it's a tough question right now. I mean, I think we're all trying to figure out, you know, which way is up a little bit. Um, obviously, interest rates have have jumped quickly. Um, you know, they're likely to continue to climb. Um, we seem to be headed toward a recession, and and again, usually student housing holds up well. Um, in that, um, but obviously when rates go up, cap rates tend to follow. So, um, we, we have in the last, I mean, I don't know if this will continue or not in the last nine to 12 months, we saw a lot of people that had been in multifamily coming over to student, some that had been in student before, um, others that, uh, others that hadn't just because they, the kind of the Delta between returns and multifamily versus student housing and widened to a point where it got sort of interesting. And that's largely just because multifamily went, you know, berserk for such a, for such a long time there. But uh, I think student housing, it, you know, looks attractive. It's proven itself to be recession resistant. Um, cap rates are not so ridiculous that they can't, you know, they'll go up a bit, but they can weather higher interest rates a little bit better. Um, you know, we didn't see cap rates in the blow threes in, in, in student with, you know, very, very, very few exceptions. So, um, you know, I, I think it'll, it'll hold up well, um, but we're all curious to see, you know, what the capital flows look like in a, in a new world here of you know, interest rates in the fives again. Yeah, I, I think, you know, out of the conference, the uh, two biggest takeaways were uh, fight to quality and uh, consolidation. And I'll explain both. So fight to quality, is really, um, you know, obviously there's different tiers of universities, right? There's tier two, tier, tier, tier three, and then the markets um, that they're in are also, you know, kind of tiered. Um, Triad has traditionally done a lot of business in what we would call the secondary and tertiary markets. Um, you know, so the, um, you know, Eastern Illinois of the world and, uh, you know, the sort of um, state schools that are not necessarily the brand name schools. Um, and, and what I've noticed, um, and this has been kind of an ongoing trend, is that um, the, the larger money, the institutional money, all just wants um, a flight to quality. You know, so they're willing to pay more, significantly more, um, for the security of a, of a University of Michigan or um, University of Wisconsin or University of Texas, right? Because those schools aren't going anywhere, any, you know, ever. Um, and there's always going to be um, a very high demand for those types of schools. Um, you know, some of the secondary and tertiary schools, when you look at, you know, enrollment trends and even population growth um, and the number of kids applying to schools, um, you know, projected over the next decade, you know, there's a lot of speculation that a number of these schools, you know, might just go away. I mean, you know, a lot of people think, you know, a lot of experts or quote unquote experts think that we, you know, we have way too many colleges and universities in the U.S. Um, compared to what the actual demand is. Um, and so, you know, I do think that that's going to um, impact things going forward. And that's kind of the consolidation point, both consolidation in terms of where people want to invest and then consolidation in terms of the investor profile. Um, you know, there's, there are fewer buyers buying a lot more property than there has been in the past. You know, so it's, it's got an institutional, um, it's really grown up 
you know, to be an institutional level asset class. And, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, a really fragmented market, um, it's becoming a lot more consolidated in terms of, you know, who the major players are. And I think you're going to see eventually, you know, maybe, you know, a dozen or more 20 groups, you know, own, you know, the overwhelming majority of student housing around the country. It feels like that's the direction we're going. I don't know if you agree so, with that, but that's my opinion. No, I'm, 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 you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'm, I'm curious, you know, drilling down, you know, aside from the flight to quality, you know, what should, let's say, investors entering this space now be focused on looking at acquisitions, let's say, within, uh, you know, a primary market? You know, what are some, you know, green flags to look for in terms of, you know, what you want as an investor, you know, especially right now in the marketplace? Um, you know, yeah. I guess it depends yeah. on your overall s strategy a little bit. Um, you know, obviously there are folks out there that with more of a core core plus strategy or value add type strategy, but generally speaking, you know, you're looking for positive demographic trends, uh, which is to say enrollment growth, um, uh, application growth. And, you know, you know, I really like to look for, is it, is it a university that has a national reputation and can continue to pull nationally. And if not, is it then in an area of the country that has positive demographic tailwinds, um, Southeast, uh, Mountain West, parts of the country like that, that if you're going to draw regionally, you want that regional pie to, to be growing. That's sort of the macro type of stuff. And then on the deal level, you know, we always say, you know, I walked a class where you can, that's less important in, in certain markets that are a little more, um, you know, commuter focus, but I think always being close to campus is, is best in, and I really advise people to look at barriers to entry. So demographics are the, are big one. I think it's a, the huge item that people miss on sometimes. And then, and then barriers to entry, um, because you're, 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 it's like investing in multifamily in a, in a one factory town. Okay. And so if the university, even if the university is growing, if, you know, there's too much building going on, the supply demand balance can be sent out of whack pretty quickly when you're talking about a driver of 20, 30,000 kids, um, or, or even if it's a big school of 50, 60,000. So, um, you know, looking at that and understanding what that future competition looks like and, and what it takes to develop there, I think is, uh, is also pretty critical. Yeah, that, this, the supply demand component is key. One, one of the things that we saw happening uh, probably about five or six years ago now, when we were kind of in the middle of this, like, you know, rush to build, uh, you know, new product now that the market had seen, you know, how well it was being received and what kind of rents people were getting, um, you know, they, they basically, you know, built a lot of new product very quickly in a number of these larger markets. I mean, two that come to mind are, you know, Champaign, where we've done a lot of business in um, um, University of Arkansas, I'm selling a property there right now. And, you know, they, they sort of had a glut of new inventory that was all delivered around the same time, right? So they, they sort of get this scarlet letter for a period of time of like, you know, this market is quote unquote overbuilt, right? But then what ends up happening is it, it ends up, you know, through a cycle or two, it ends up getting absorbed. And because it had the reputation of being overbuilt, people stopped building there, right? And so eventually these sort of the supply demand metrics kind of work themselves out in a lot of these markets. Um, and we've seen you know, a, a number of them that, you know, three, four years ago were considered, you know, to be overbuilt with new product are now, you know, 90 to 95% occupied and that all that new inventory has been absorbed. So I think that, you know, we put out these research reports that probably have, you know, on a specific market, like take East Lansing, and there's probably like, you know, a dozen different data points that, that we look at um, to determine, you know, whether, 
we would give sort of a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a market um, in terms of whether it's a, now is a good time to invest there or not. You know, and if, if now is not a good time, it could be two years from now when some of the new inventory gets absorbed. So for anyone listening, tap into that data. You know, if you're yeah, thinking a, of getting that was, into that was, a, that was a plug for our uh, for our analyst team. Well, you know, for anybody that's in, interested in entering the space, you know, you want as much information as possible before you jump into the pool, right? And you know, the, as many swim instructors as you can get, like get them, right? You don't want to drown out there. You know, you want Michael Phelps, you know, on the sideline cheering you on. You've got two of them here uh, at a triad, so make sure well, and, and we'll. You know, if I could add to that too, because you know we're we're very um, sort of thoughtful about how we approach this, because um, you know the information you know on our website there's a research tab, and it's, a, it's you know they're three page reports, but they have a ton of data from sort of disparate sources that we you know spend a lot of time and effort pulling together and and you know organizing in a fashion where it, it's very um, easy to understand. And, you know, we, we put that out for free, right? Like we send that to every owner in the market and, you know, because we, one, we want people obviously to be educated, but we also want them to look at us as, you know, market experts, right? And we feel like when we, when we, you know, sort of gather all of this information together and, and put it together in a way that doesn't exist out there, we just give it away where, you know, we've seen people kind of charge for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we feel like that gives us a lot of credibility in terms of understanding, you know, the, the dynamics of one market compared to another. And, and honestly, like that's probably been one of our best, you know, marketing tools um, because we get a lot of phone calls from people saying, hey, I saw your report on, you know, Iowa City. Um, I want to learn more. Right. And, and so it's sort of like, a you know, get what you give kind of approach to to putting uh, information out there um, that we know is beneficial to investors. Well, information is power and Triad is you know, giving away power for free, especially if you're looking into this space. So I encourage anybody that's interested to go and take advantage of those resources. You know, finally, our last topic, what advice would you give to fellow brokers working or looking you know, to get involved in the student housing space? And what advice would you give to your clients? Um, it's crowded here, man. Stay, stay out of our space. No, <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, yeah, you know, how much, yeah, how often I hear that. Every space else. is crowded. <laughs> yeah, right. There's no more. No, That's my advice. No, yeah, there's no deals. Uh, <laughs> no, for, you know, for brokers, it, I don't know. I think it's, it, listen, it's a, it's a great, it's a great space. I, I think it's a great asset class. There's a lot of great asset classes and I think you can make money in, in just about any of them. And and most of the lessons are, are the same. I mean, um, you know, make yourself an expert in, in your particular markets, uh, you know, and your asset class. So, uh, obviously become a, an expert and student, but I always highly recommend that folks stick to a, a, a footprint, a relatively small footprint to start and know it inside and out. Um, you know, if you're just kind of cold calling across college campuses across the country and you don't know anything about them, um, you know, it's going to come back to bite you a little bit. So, uh, I recommend, you know, going deep, um, in, you know, as a select market or number of markets and starting with that. Um, and that, but that's just sort of general advice to all, all you know, brokers that I give, um, all the time. So, um, and it applies just as much to student as it does to anything else. Um, I don't know, Sean, if you've got some, some, some broker wisdom. wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I have tons of wisdom, man. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Well, we only have a few minutes, so I let's know, we can squeeze uh, in. I would say, you know, there's a number of, and I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, the fact that it's a niche industry, I think is very helpful um, because it's, it's a lot easier to sort of get your arms around. And so there's a number of these, that, you know, there's the big event every year in Austin. There's a number of sort of um, offshoot events. You know, I probably go to four or five student housing conferences a year at uh, different parts of the country and, you know, st and stay in front of people, right? So they, so everybody, if you ask anybody in student housing, 
who Triad is, you know, they're going to know, uh, or at least I would hope they would know at this point. Um, and that's because we're out there, you know, in front of people. And the the way that the industry is set up um, is, you know, it's there's a ton of money. I mean, there's a ten billion dollar plus, you know, market that trades hands in a given year. Um, but there's not necessarily a ton of players um, compared to a lot of the other product types. And so, you know, you, you got to make yourself visible and be in front of the, the active groups who, you know, you know, are out there and, and really, you know, just like any other business, but particularly in brokerage, like it's very relationship driven, you know? So a lot of our business today comes from, you know, repeat clients who we've done, you know, multiple transactions with, and they own large portfolios of student housing pro property. Uh, and, and they, you know, they like working with us and we like working with them and they come back to us, you know, again and again, because they know what to expect. Right. And so you got to build up that trust and credibility, just like anywhere else, you know, and then you, you asked about, uh, you know, from a customer standpoint or from an investor standpoint, you know, I think that, uh, you know, once all the dust settles on the world, you know, trying to be normal again in a, in a post-COVID, you know, reality, um, that, you know, student housing has really proven to um, be able to pretty much weather, you know, any storm that it's been thrown its way since its, its inception. And so, you know, everybody in the, in the industry always says this, but, you know, we're bullish on the fact that, you know, it, it's... Um, it's here to stay and and it's been accepted and embraced in the current form uh and and that you know i think there's going to continue to be uh, a lot of interest particularly for, from an institutional level you know I, the, the analogy i always use is like when we got into it it was kind of like a you know toddler um and now it's grown up to be a full you know adult like it, the industry has matured to the point where you know, significant foreign capital and institutional investors uh, want to be involved. And so I, I think that's a really good sign going forward. Growing up. Yeah. Growing up. We all got it. We all got to grow up at some point. Yes. Well, <laughs> not if I can help it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, Thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to hear your insights, especially on such timely and important topics. We really appreciate your time today. I know you're very busy, so thank you for taking the time this morning to sit down with us. Yeah, and you guys, I just before you sign off, you guys do a great job um, with everything you do. We use your platform for a number of reasons, uh, and you know, we put properties up there uh, that we list. So thank you for for what you guys have brought to the industry in, in a relatively short period of time. It's very impressive what you've done. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, where can people, if they want to get in touch, where can they find you online? Social media, email, share with us where we can uh, get in touch and see that report. Yeah, try uh, it. Yeah. Try at repartners.com is the best way. Go to our website, try at re, like real estate partners.com. And feel free to drop a note, Sean or myself, anytime on email. Um, even if it's just uh, grab a few minutes of time to chat like this about student housing, we're always happy to do so. Um, or if you're young and looking to break into the business or anything like that, um, we're here. So. Tremendous. Thank you, gentlemen. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one visit go.crexy.com forward slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time. Mm -hmm.